My name's Simon Price. I'm a British music journalist. Um, and I'm here today with David Laurie, who has written uh, this book, Dare, um, which is a, uh, is a history, really, um, as well as a polemical argument um, about a certain era in, in pop history. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, I thought I'd kind of steer the discussion by using the, the chapters in the book, the, the way it's broken down, to kind of frame the discussion. But um, first of all, uh, we're, we're here under the title De Synthi Revolution. Um, and I just wondered if, uh, David, um, if you recognize that particular synth on the picture there. I do not. I do not. This is Synthi. If I was to give you a clue and say that that synthesizer did its best work in this city, would that help? Is it a Moog of sorts? Nope. Uh, if I, I maybe in the audience, if anyone uh, recognises it or can guess that um, this synthesizer did its best work right here in Berlin and was also part of an exhibition in a museum in this city not long ago. Okay. Right, well, I'll tell you, that is the EMS uh, Synthi A used by Brian Eno on David Bowie's Heroes album. And if you look at the photo, you can see it's actually there in the museum in the glass case. So that's the, uh, the machine making the weird noises on, on Heroes along with Robert Fripp's guitar. And it's particularly um, pertinent to the uh, discussion we're going to have because a lot of the book, uh, particularly the early part, does detail pretty much your kind of Love affair with David Bowie's music, doesn't it? It does, yeah. It shines all the way through, I think. Bowie's been my idol since I was 12, I think. Um, there was one summer when I did a paper round and I bought all of his albums, one per week, with my money. And it just changed my life completely. Honestly. Did you go in chronological order or just, you know, get... The f uh, no, I think it was quite random. Yeah. It was quite random. But... um. I, just, I think Bowie's just the, probably the most influential pop artist, well, certainly for me anyway, and certainly I think in the, in the early 80s, he was the catalyst and the inspiration for so many bands. Well, this is the argument the book makes. If I can just, maybe we should start with that, because on the very front cover of the book, it does say, as you can see, um, how Bowie and Kraftwerk inspired the death of rock and roll and invented modern pop music, which is a very bold claim to make. It is bold. So um, I wondered if, obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a weighty tome. Believe me, this is heavier than it looks. Um, it's, it's a very closely argued and thoroughly argued case that you make. But it, it's almost an impossible task. But if you could sum up in brief um, why you think those two particular artists um, were the ones who uh, basically um, did what you say they did and... Uh, inspired the death of rock and roll and invented modern pop music? Well, I think the synthesizer inspired the death of rock and roll. Obviously, rock and roll is still alive and kicking. But when they became available and cheaply available in the early 80s, 81, 82, they dropped from sort of £15,000 to £1,000. So people could suddenly afford them. And it just changed the whole idea of what being in a band was. Prior to that, if you were in a band, you had to go and find three or four like-minded individuals and train them to all play at the same time and blah, 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 and had to deal with four different personalities and it was just very complicated and still is. But once the synthesizers became freely available, anybody could make a music. Anybody could make music. It became super democratic. You didn't even really need to be a musician at all, just have lots of strong ideas and patience to wade through the uh, weighty manuals that came with these, operating manuals that came with the synths. But surely at this time, uh, you would have been, what, 12 years old or something in the era we're talking about? Uh, probably 13, yeah. Yeah. Um, so surely that, if, even that, that world of um, democratised synths and, you know, a thousand pounds was still a lot of money, must have seemed unimaginable and just baffling to you at the time? Or, or were you a kind of a precocious kind of synth nerd? Did you know, could you tell, you know, your Korgs from your Rolands from your Moogs? Oh, absolutely not. Not at all. I still can't, to be honest. Yeah. I, I was just, it, bands just started looking different. And I was 13, 14 at the time and looking at Top of the Pops, a British TV weekly show. And there was just all these strange new things on every week. Weird looking people with weird sounds that we just hadn't heard before. Or hadn't been, certainly hadn't been in the charts. Um, and I think, I think that was the 
I don't know what I was going to say. Well, um, I, I was just going to ask, uh, when you were researching the book, because it is, as well as being a very, a very personal book, because it, it's, it's a lot about um, how the music felt to you at the time, how exciting it was, what an impact these artists made on your life, it's also very, very thoroughly researched and very, very detailed indeed about the origins and the making of some of these great records. Um, did you have to kind of uh, belatedly become quite knowledgeable, knowledgeable about synthesizers? Well, not, it, not ab about the technical aspect at all, but I think a lot of the, well, pretty much all of the knowledge was there, because I kind of, it was my time. When, I think when you're 14, it's the most impressionable that you're ever going to be, and music is just kind of the most important thing, or certainly was to me at the time. I think it's perhaps less important to kids these days, um, but it was everything to me. I lived in South Wales, as did Simon, yeah. and we either too young or too far away from London to see these bands or meet these people or have any real part of it. But Yeah, for, for people who don't know, by the way, South Wales is, or certainly was in the late 70s, early 80s, um, a kind of post-industrial uh, wasteland, really. <laughs> I, I, I don't know enough about Germany to imagine uh, if there's a part of Germany to which it could be compared, but it was... Um, a kind of ex coal mining area, or it still was a coal mining area, um, and lots, you know, lots of steel making as well, uh, okay. but also quite a lot of unemployment. And it didn't feel like a place where culture was within reach, did it? It felt that, that things that went on in the world of pop and arts and culture were somewhere else, somewhere out of reach. Absolutely. They were like the, well, you'd hear about bands and scenes and clubs and records, and they'd long since split up or given up by the time they reached where we lived. They were like looking at sort of dying stars and um, long, long since burned out. They just, it, culture never seemed to happen at all where I grew up at all. There was people who were into sport and drinking and that's about it really. Um, I mean the premise of the book, um, and th there's a list of bands underneath the title Dare, uh, if you can't make it out there, it's OMD, New Order, Human League, Cure, Bunny Men, ABC, Japan, Simple Minds, Duran, Associates, and then it says 1979 to 1982. Now the thing is, um, there is a kind of disease in popular culture, or, or the discourse around popular culture, of golden age-ism. Uh, everybody likes to imagine that there was some kind of golden age where everything was better than it, it was before and has ever been since. Some people think it was, you know, the 1950s, the birth of rock and roll. Others would say uh, the early 60s, the beat boom in, in the UK. Um, some would say the late 60s in, in San Francisco, the flower power era. Others would say um, early 70s prog or, or maybe glam. They might say the late 70s punk era. And then they, even more recently that, people would, would talk about the late 80s acid house, early 90s grunge. But, and and it, it's quite often tinted by nostalgia. It's all to do with, as you say, when you're 14, you're at your most impressionable. But I, I, would, I would stand up for this era, 1979 to 81 in particular, being the high point of the most exciting and inventive pop being made. And I'll specify pop because I think the point that you've made in these books, these kind of freaks and weirdos and outsiders, they, they weren't making obscure records that you had to be cool to know about. They were having hit records, weren't they? Well, absolutely. This is the thing. The, the exciting and the, the critically acclaimed and the sort of uh, inventive records were, were massive hits and instant hits. Um, I mean, there's always... It, to this day, exciting new music, but it's usually buried underground, and it you know takes years to filter through. But there was such a sort of rocket-powered, rocket-propelled excitement behind these bands. They'd formed maybe six months previously, and they were selling 300,000 albums a week later. They were doing obscure radio sessions in January and meeting the Queen at the Royal Variety performance in December. We should say, by the way, um, you weren't from South Wales originally. You were, from, you were from, born in London, is that right? I was born in London. And then you went back to London um, uh, uh, at what age to, to get involved in the music industry? Oh, 1991 or thereabouts. Yeah. So um, uh, if, if you could tell people a little bit about um, your... your Because you aren't a writer by trade. You know, no. you, don't, you don't have to write this. You, you, you wrote this because you absolutely love this era. So what, what was your life within or what has your life been within the music industry? Um, I came to London to try and be an A&R man, uh, and I found that was quite a difficult job to get. Um, and I started a club, and I knew a few A&R people through a few mutual friends. And I just discovered all the bands that, uh, that people were looking at and all the A&R people wanted to go and see. And they didn't really want to go to Sheffield or Manchester or Glasgow to go and see these bands. So I booked them in a club in London. And so the place was filled with A&R people week in, week out. Which club was this? Uh, it was called Spangle. Okay. Um, and... A&R people being 
a bit stupid, really. Um, their bosses would come in and see all these happening bands and assume that I knew everything about everything. But really, I was just listening to what everyone was doing and copying it and booking the bands there and bringing them to London. So it was kind of a thriving little hotbed of creativity. And uh, it was kind of the cool club in London for about three or four years, eh, maybe three years. Um, and I got a job within about two months of starting it. With Who was that with? Uh, with a label called Nude, uh, which is a Sony subsidiary that had uh, Suede and Geneva and Black Box Recorder and various other bands on the label. And now you run a label yourself? I do. I've been running a label called Something in Construction for the last 10 years or so. Um, a much, much smaller affair. It's quite a different uh, situation. Back in the 90s, I would commission videos for £50,000 like it wasn't anything at all, whereas I very much doubt I've spent £50,000 on the label these days. It's a much, much, much different affair. And it's much more DIY, and uh, I quite enjoy it more. It's much more hands-on and, and fun. So um, at what point during all of this did the idea come to you that you wanted to write a book about an era way before you, you were actually physically involved in the music industry? Uh, but the writing of the book was kind of an accident. I was going to work with an American band who were making music that sounded a bit like Japan and the Thompson Twins, but in a good way. Um, and I wrote a very, very, very long press release, and it ran to about 20 pages. And I sent it to somebody, and I said, why don't you publish this as an article in Mojo? And they said, because you don't write for Mojo, you're not a journalist, but you've got a good idea, why don't you make it into a book? Um, and of sort of three or four fever feverish months of writing, I had, um, well, certainly a lot of words. Um, it took another year to make it into a book, I think, but it was kind of an accident. I'd never really written, it, written anything before. And um, if we can return to um, the kind of initial case that you make in the book, and I'll just skip on to the next slide here. Um, heroes, just who did invent the 80s. And the, the two artists who, well, on the very front of the book, you've seized upon are Bowie and Kraftwerk. And um, again, yeah, if, if you could just say why those two in particular... I th well, certainly when I was writing the book, I was researching lots of old music press, and it just seemed to me that every single band referenced David Bowie as an influence. He was just the common factor. Almost. You're talking about in uh, Smash Hits magazine? Sm Smash Hits and Enemy and, and all the music magazines. Sooner or later, someone would kind of flag him up as being the sole inspiration for their career. And it just made me think that he, his fingers had sort of seeped into the culture. In the, in the early 80s, he hadn't put an album out for, uh, for uh, two years, I think. Scary Monsters is 1980. Yeah, no, Prior that's to that, 83, so three years of no album, yeah. Yeah, he'd released an album every eight months, it seems, for ten years prior to that. But his, his presence was everywhere. He was in films and acting and on television and, and still making random, you know, make a record with Queen or with Bing Crosby or all kinds of odd, strange people. And it just seemed that he his, punctuated the culture. Um, and looking into it and looking back in detail at what the history of Bowie, he'd been extremely obsessed with craft work and Noi. Um, he'd approached Noi to work on Station to Station and they turned him down. Um, but he was just absolutely blown away and excited by the possibilities of the synthetic music and the synthesizers. And he had the money and the uh, opportunity to use the very expensive early synths. Yeah. And he had Brian Eno as well. Yeah. Um, but it just seemed like a massive catalyst. This sort of endless, sleek, plastic music that just went on and on forever with no rough edges, no sweaty clubs, no sort of arguments and rehearsals. The synthesizer just sort of just arrived overnight. And I think, I think in the early 80s, we had computers arrived and digital watches. And the early digital watches were rubbish. They just had a few little beeps. They'd go beep or boop or beep. And people would just push these buttons endlessly. The beep was just so exciting. Yeah, yeah. I think culture you'd seen, you know, Star Wars and Alien and all these various sci-fi films set in the future, and everything beeped. If you look at the sort of the, uh, the bridge of whatever starship, there were just beeps everywhere. And it seemed quite alien. And finally, people could make this music, and they had watches that beeped. And we began to have the very early primitive computers, which beeped a lot. Didn't do very much else other than that. But... I think we just fell in love with the beep. It just sounded like the future was actually sort of within our grasps and there was beeps in the house and there was beeps on your wrist. And it was just, it, was, it really felt like the future had arrived. The 70s had been kind of very, very drab and basically a sort of 
endless hangover from the 60s and bands had just got their hair got longer. They're skirting around punk for a second, but, but the music hadn't really changed that much. Bands just looked like bands and all of a sudden, everything changed. The records sounded completely different. They, there were no records, or very few, we can go on to that in a second, that had sounded like that. There were a few, I guess, in the 70s, bands like Sparks and George Emeroda, records with Donna Summer, and just, but there were and random hits like M's pop music, which seemed like a novelty record. Donna Summer's I Feel Love kind of sounded like a novelty record. But these were kind of the precursors of, of modern pop music. So you credit, the, sorry, go ahead. And the 80s. Um, as well as Bowie, uh, you equally credit Kraftwerk with um, inspiring all of this. But um, is it right that you didn't actually encounter their music until maybe after a lot of the people that they'd inspired came Oh, absolutely, away? yes. I think Kraftwerk had had a, a few international hits in the 70s with uh, Autobahn, which is top 30 in, the, in the America. And I think... Uh, Computer Love had done really well, but by and large they were a kind of an unknown quantity and it seemed like, well it certainly seemed to me when I was 14, when the model was re-released three or four years after it came out and was a number two hit in the UK, it, they finally kind of broke through into sort of popular culture and people knew who they were. The kids knew who they were and they were having actual hits. Yeah. And it, I think those who knew Crawford didn't really see them as a pop band, they were kind of seen as experimental and strange and and slightly po-faced. And I think that was very, very unfair. I think they're an extremely funny, witty and silly band, really, with their sort of crap jokes and... Home sweet home. Home sweet home, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, and, of course, in one of their songs, they, they mention meeting uh, Iggy Pop and David Bowie, so it kind of completes the circle. Absolutely, yes. Um, and, and obviously, and we're, we're, not, we're not just saying this because, because we're here in Berlin, but um, you do spend quite a lot of the early part of the book um, talking about German music of, of the 1970s. And in a sense, it, it seems as if the 80s, you know, what, what we know culturally as the 80s, to a large extent, were born here in Germany. Um, certainly, an awful lot of it was, absolutely. Neu, never, never really. I mean, people haven't heard Neu, by and large, I don't think. But no, they were the sort of name that you'd read about in, uh, in the music press, or they'd be name-dropped by somebody's kind of hip older brother. But it was almost like a kind of mythical thing that you couldn't actually get their records. And well, of course. And prior to the internet, you had to literally go and find a record to hear what it sounded like. Um, and, but noise, endless, slow, uh, repetitive, beautiful music. It basically formed the basis of all electronic music, I think. And the same went for Can. They had one novelty hit, but you couldn't really get their music. Tangerine Dream, you might hear, because they were kind of affiliated with Prague and, and they there were film soundtracks. Soundtracks, and stuff. of course, yeah. yes. But, but mostly, th this whole world of what became known as kraut rock, and that's kind of a controversial term to some extent, but it, it's, it, it's what it's become known as. Um, again, it was just this kind of mythical thing that people would claim to be into, and you think, well, where are you even hearing this stuff? Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. They were just very, very hip names to drop, but you kind of had the impression people didn't actually know what the music was. But the bands that we listened to, they had heard that stuff, and that's what mattered. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of the... Po One of the theories that I put forward in the book is that punk wasn't the greatest cultural revolution that it's made out to be. It shook things up a lot, but it didn't change things that much, and it wasn't entirely revolutionary, and it didn't make make the world go punk, that just didn't happen. And I think when the synth pop came in, that did change things and everything was influenced by it and it spread like a virus throughout music. And well, I this think, is, this I is the, I'm, I'm glad you brought punk up because the, this is the one basis, or one of the basis on, on which your book could be challenged or certainly that your argument could be challenged because um, I think it would be equally easy to make a case that punk plus disco uh, invented the 80s. You know, punk rock, for the kind of um, DIY spirit of it, and it is, disco sonically, yes. Nile Rodgers and Chic. Nile Rodgers maybe being as big an influence on uh, on the eighties as Georgia Moroda or as Kraftwerk. I think that's fair, absolutely, absolutely. But um, the European canon that Bowie spoke of in nineteen seventy five didn't really exist. He was listening to various obscure records, obscure at the time, but it didn't. It, a few years later, it, that actually came to pass, and I think those records were essential. 
Do you think of uh, Giorgio Moroder as a German artist, by the way? Because obviously he was, he was from I, Italy, but from a German-speaking family and so on. And I do think of him as a German artist, yeah. yes. And um, in terms of um, when things actually changed, and we can move on to the next slide here, you've got a chapter called Dawning of a New Era, Colour Ends the 70s. And, and you did talk just now about how kind of drab and grey the 1970s felt. Um, in Britain, and particularly in, in South Wales, where, where you and I were both living. Um, and, and you picked out uh, these three bands, particularly The Jam, The Specials, and Adam and the Ants, for that chapter. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about this, what you meant by that, what you meant by colour ending the 70s. Well, absolutely. That's, I should point out that punk rock and post-punk is the cornerstone of my music collection. They're my favourite records fall in. in yeah, and categories. none of these are synth artists, obviously. That's Not at thing. all, no. But the jam were kind of came out of punk. There was, was a mod revival thing, of course, but they were basically informed by punk and they had black and white suits and they were very austere and joyless and serious and um, um, important sounding. It was very sort of uh, purposeful. And, um, and the specials and the, the whole ska revival was obviously very black and white as its sort of aesthetic. But again, it was quite serious and intense and political and... Um, well, yeah, serious, and I think the case in point is Adam and the Ants. Adam and the Ants' first record is a kind of sounds a bit like Susie and the Banshees. It's black and white sleeves, very serious, no smiling. Um, you mean the album Dirk wears white socks? I do, yeah, I right. do. But all of these bands changed massively in the sort of 1981, 1982 thing. Paul Weller broke up the, the jam at the peak of their powers and started making sort of funk records and jazz records and all kinds of strangeness and having fun and having soul and funk and um which a lot of his fan base hated and it, it would, and the style council were rejected almost en masse by the jam fan base the jam were the biggest band in britain and they suddenly started making records that all of their fan base hated the specials were one of the biggest bands in britain and at the height of their powers having just released ghost town which is a really dark and weird and serious and doomy record uh, Jerry Dammers said he just wanted it to sound doomy. That was the idea behind Ghost Town. And then six months later, Terry Hall had had enough of it, and he was making silly records with a band called the Fun Boy 3, which was guaranteed to piss off his audience. And Adam Ant had his band stolen by Malcolm McLaren and had a massive rethink and came back as a, as a riot of colour, with makeup and... Um, it's almost the return of glam in a way, it wasn't was it? Absolutely. Adam? After the austerity of punk, and particularly post-punk, well, a lot of those records are very black and white. I'm thinking about Public Image Limited and Cabaret Voltaire and early Human League records. They're very austere and they're not fun. They're kind of very serious. There's no smiling face. There's no sort of joy to it all. But all of those bands switched and became ridiculously popular. They said, actually, we're going to have hits. They had a rethink, went away for six months, came back again and did have hits. But in a, in a weird way, without necessarily compromising, because certainly in the case of Adam and the Ants, the first couple of singles with his new lineup, Kings of the Wild Frontier and Dog Eat Dog, are very odd records, and they, were, yeah. they became sort of top five hits. They, were, they did, yeah, absolutely. Uh, but the, 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 it was the, the speed of the change. It was to, instead of being kind of like a sort of boring, music press-friendly, punk rock, sn sneery band, they were just basically became unbelievably and unashamedly and unabashedly commercial. And I, I deliberately chose images of the three of them from Smash Hits magazine. Um, I, I don't know how familiar you are with Smash Hits. Um, it was a hugely important pop magazine in Britain. came up fortnightly. I believe there was a, a German franchise of it, a German version of it. I don't know how long that lasted. But I wonder if you could just explain a little bit about, about Smash Hits and why it was such a big deal. Well... Prior to the internet, it was very hard to find out about music. There was basically Top of the Pops once a week, a half-hour chart programme was the only way you saw music on the television, by and large. Um, and Smash Hits came out fortnightly, and it had just new and strange and weird, colourful bands every single week. And it seemed to, it seemed to be just an endless supply of new bands. Um, and they just looked unbelievably weird. And if you were 14 and living somewhere very boring, they just looked colourful and fun and exciting and beautiful. And, um, and they were. And they were. And even though you very often hadn't heard the music, 
you sort of had to picture it in your mind. You'd read about it in the music press, um, and even later on, when I was older, I would read The Enemy or M Melody Maker. You still hadn't heard these records. You sort of, journalists like yourself, conjured up pictures for you, and you had to kind of imagine what it was. Like, that sounds like something I would like. And Smash Hits was just a, an explosion, a riot of confetti colour every fortnight. And it's just, I've got to find out what this is. I've got to find out what this is. I, I need to hear this record. I need to buy that record. And I couldn't keep up. And it was also quite kind of mischievous and subversive in its way, wasn't it? It was. It was very, very... The journalists were very smart, and it had a, a house style, and it was irreverent, but... But what would be the word? Help me out. Well, I, I think in a way, it kind of dispensed with the old star system. They, they didn't have this kind of fawning respect for rock stars that maybe um, magazines had in the 70s. And um, David Hepworth, the um, assistant editor, sent out a, um, a letter to all the major record labels in London and said, from now on, we will be asking your artists about the colour of their socks and stuff like that, or what they've had for breakfast. It will be deliberately trivial. And um, the weird thing is that sometimes that got really um, in, enlightening answers out of people. Neil Tennant, who went on to be famous with the Pet Shop Boys, but um, was um, also at one point the assistant head of Smash Hits, um, said that if, if you ask a band, for example, um, does your mum play golf? It sounds like a ridiculous question, but you can actually... That taps into all kinds of weird things about, about social class and, and uh, you know, just, just culture within Britain. And you can get some really enlightening answers rather than just saying, hmm, tell me about the inspiration behind your new album. Well, exactly. That's the classic boring interview. And, it, it, you know, once you've read 15 or 20 or 500 of those interviews, they're just boring. Every band story is the same. Every band story is the same. But Smash Hits were enthusiastic and respectful of these and in awe of these of these artists, but just took the piss out of them mm. constantly. I mean, really, there there were three kind of pillars culturally um, of pop music in the UK at this time. Top of the Pops, which was a TV show that went out on on a Thursday evening, thirty or forty minutes long of just the latest hits performed or mimed mimed in a BBC studio. You had BBC Radio One, which is the main kind of um, mainstream um, state radio station playing pop music. And I think you had smash hits. I think those were the big three for learning about what was going on in pop. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and uh, sorry, go ahead. It, 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 musicians tend to get very boring when they're talking about themselves, and it, it just—it is very tedious. And smash hits made it fun. They communicated the joy and the colour and the life of the music by pointing out that it was fun or making people sort of laugh at themselves or not take themselves too seriously and t take a different, a different look at themselves differently, a different perspective. Another thing that all three of these artists symbolise in a way is that pop was very, very tribal at this time. That particularly if you're at school, you had to be in one gang or another gang or another gang. You couldn't just be somebody who liked a bit of everything. That wasn't allowed. There would be fights, you know, um, particularly... Uh, in the summertime and on bank holidays at seaside resorts between warring factions of mods and, uh, you know, skinheads and, uh, and, and other um, Teds who were sort of rock and rollers and, and uh, other factions. Did you buy into any of that yourself? Did I go fighting at the seaside? Well, I'm not I, saying I that not, necessarily, no. <laughs> but, but were, you, were you of a tribe? No. Well, yes, I think when I, in 1979, when Two Tones started, that was the kind of first time I felt like I was involved in a scene. And it helped that the clothes were black and white and you had to wear a white shirt and tidy trousers and basically looked like school uniform <laughs> yeah. with your blazer taken off. And so everybody could do it. Everyone had a pair of black shoes and black trousers with a crease down the middle and a white shirt. As long as you made your tie skinny, mm. you could be part of the two-tone thing. It was quite accessible and it was huge in Britain. Did two-tone cross into Europe? I don't know. No, I'm not sure that it did really. Um, I think, you know, maybe the, the Scar revival um, took a long while to kind of belatedly break through, particularly in the States. I think it was like 10 years later where you had bands like Real Big Fish and No Doubt playing Scar music in the US. Um, and then people like Dave Wakeling from The Beat could have a second career over there, but the beat, I'm not sure. The Beat actually went to America a lot at yeah. the time. Were the specials and madness big here in the early 80s? Open question. Clearly not. Answer. <laughs> I'm going to go for no. Okay. Yeah. And I, it, madness, were they? That's interesting because I, I was going to say they seem like the most British 
ban possible culturally, but yes, yeah, in in a way that in the same way that people like Blur were in the mid nineties, maybe. Absolutely. Um, so n none of these three bands, as I say, were were synth artists, and synth music had been kind of very slowly making its way through um, kind of uh, people who who were in touch with the avant-garde, such as David Bowie. Mm -hmm. um, but it hadn't quite broken into the mainstream yet, with the exception of a few isolated hits, as, as you mentioned. And then suddenly it did. And um, if we go on to, uh, here we go. This, this, you've got a chapter in the book called The Sound of the Crowd, Synth Pop Arrives. And um, you've picked out, uh, particularly that chapter, Gary Newman, um, OMD, um, The Human League, and Ultravox. And, um, and Visage. Let's put and them have you, Visage as well. Um, and it did seem to happen, well, certainly the way you portray it in the book, very, very instantly. Absolutely. But they, instead of being maybe initially just one or two synth records, within, by late 79 into early 1980, there was lots and lots and lots of them all of a sudden. And it was, it was exciting. It was exciting seeing these bands sweep into the charts. Yeah. It, it was often, um, when I mentioned the TV show Top of the Pops, there would be something quite subversive about the way that these synth bands presented themselves. They would appear on the show and they would deliberately, I mean, there would be no drum kit for, for starters. Uh, they would just be um, a couple of guys with, with synthesizers. And quite often they would have a reel-to-reel -reel tape machine behind them. It wasn't really doing anything, but it was there kind of symbolically, almost to deliberately annoy um, people who considered themselves to be real musicians, wasn't well, that, it? Absolutely, this, the Musicians' Union was very, very, very suspicious and angry about synthesizers. And you have people like Phil Collins, his first album, and I think one of the Queen records. Queen did it a, a few times. Uh, proudly say, yeah. said in the credits, well, there are no synthesizers on, these, on this record. And they felt Until Queen changed their mind and made loads of synth records. Absolutely, yeah. But it felt like they were going to put musicians out of business. And there was a... The bands who were successful, particularly the Human League, absolutely loved infuriating people. They would be deliberately anti-musician, anti-sort of sweat and graft, and they would stand on stage doing as little as possible. Mm -hmm. And you have these sort of synth duos like Blamange or uh, Soft Cell, where the musician in the band is just standing there and only moving his fingers. Nothing else at all. It was the complete antithesis of, of work. And that, that kind of stereotype is something that you trace back to Sparks in the book, isn't it? The kind of flamboyant, expressive lead singer and a very dour, almost immobile, quite sinister Absolutely. synth player. Sparks are a weird band, aren't they? They haven't really changed. They, they're kind of like The Fall. They kind of make the same record over and over again, but always the same, always different. Yeah. Um, but they, you know, Sparks invented Soft Cell and Blamange and... Pet Shop Boys. Pet Shop Boys. Yazoo, all, all of those. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I love the way you describe this moment in the book of, of you know, the sudden arrival of, of the synth bands as being like close encounters of the third kind, where the UFO is just suddenly hovering overhead. Absolutely, and, yeah. yeah. This is making, the whole making weird bleep, bleeping noises. Absolutely, this, this fascination with lights and bleeps and, and plastic noises and plastic sounds. And the Human League really sort of extended Kraftwerk's idea of, of not putting any work into the music and standing on stage doing very little. I think they were going to support Talking Heads on stage, the Human League, and their manager put out a press release saying that on some occasions the band would not appear on stage. They were going to be in the audience watching their machines making the music, and that did not go down well at all. They were yeah. kicked off the tour after about two dates, I think. Yeah. But I just loved that idea of, of not having to have sort of big sweaty men making records. The, the kind of the weirdos and the nerds and the outsiders and the oddballs could just become pop stars. And did you buy into this stuff straight away as a kind of um, scar-loving kid, as you were at the time, when the synth stuff suddenly became huge? Did you get it straight away, or Abs were, you, were you a bit resistant? Yeah, no, no, absolutely. The Human League and Ultravox and Duran Duran were hugely exciting for me. I just felt... It, it just, I just played those records over and over again. You know what? I, I think that, that took quite a lot of bravery at the time, because certainly in my town, you, you were living in Cardiff, weren't you? I was. Cardiff being relatively cosmopolitan, the big capital city in Wales, I was from a small town about nine miles away. And in that town, if you were into Duran Duran or Soft Cell or the Human League, um, that was music for girls or for gays. And uh, if you were a boy, I went to an all-boys school, you had to keep that secret if you liked that music, because you might even get beaten up for liking uh, it. Don't frequently, absolutely. And if you even 
dreamt of looking like the, the, these artists on the street, you, you literally would get beaten up. Yeah. And there are, you'd be very unwise <laughs> to go into town on a Friday night looking like you were into the Human League because people would just punch you. They would just walk up and punch you on the street. And um, th this stuff did take over, and, and it, it was um, a weird kind of unholy alliance in some ways because you had these kind of very chic metropolitan bands like Visage, for example, even though Steve Strange came from a little town in the valleys of South Wales. But, you know, people from that scene in London, from the Blitz Club, very chic, very fashionable. But you also had somebody like Gary Newman, who was barely able to function as, as a human. And he, he now, uh, he's, he's got sort of self-diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum. And, and uh, once he discovered that, it sort of made, made a lot of sense of his life and, and of his music. But he, he was never kind of cool in the way that some of these other guys were cool. So it was, it, it was a weird alliance of people making this music, wasn't it? It, it was. And it, it, the Human League called their album Dev, and it was a very carefully chosen title, and I stole it for the book, obviously. But it was a day. You had to be brave to, to look like you were into this kind of music because at the time, in the late 70s and the early 80s, being gay or looking like you were gay was a very bad thing to do. Being gay was still illegal in Scotland in 1981. I think that's when it changed. I think it was 81. I'm not sure about that. 1967 but... in Britain, but 81 in Scotland. But the whole gay culture thing was very, very marginalised, and you had these hugely flamboyant TV presenters and people like Freddie Mercury, who was clearly the gayest man in the world. But people just would, wouldn't accept it. But big, sweaty men like Queen, and even though they were called Queen, and obviously fronted by a hugely gay man. They just couldn't see it. There was a sort of willful blindness to the whole thing. And a, a lot of this kind of homophobia um, embodied itself, certainly in the States, in the Disco Sucks movement. Um, and I, I don't know, uh, I'm sure a lot of you will be aware of what happened in um, Comiskey Park, a sports stadium in the States, where there was Disco Demolition Day, where um, a radio DJ encouraged people to bring their Disco 12-inch singles to the stadium and physically blow them up with dynamite in the middle of, of a baseball game. Um, so th this, this was a big deal. That, you know, Disco music was associated with gays and blacks and other marginalised communities in the States. And, there was definitely, uh, definitely and, and a lot rock, of... Ro white people were supposed to like rock music, and that was that. Well, disco music was seen as quite a black thing, I think, and it kind of became, with Saturday Night Fever, a mainstream kind of white culture as well. But prior to that, it was, yeah, gay music and black music, and, and that was marginalised. This was not the mainstream. This was kind of weird and dysfunctional and odd, and just people wouldn't admit to liking it. It wasn't part of mainstream culture, and it wasn't influential. But suddenly, uh, in the post-punk era, people who'd come out of punk rock were um, embracing that. As uh, You've got a whole chapter about this uh, in the book, Temptation. Funk gets serious, disco is exhumed. What kind of stuff are you talking about there? Well... <laughs> well, we can see three of the artists right there. We can, yeah. The, there were a lot of the, sort of the punk bands through post-punk came to embody funk, in, to use funk music, basically, in a sort of, kind of, very often in a quite dry and austere way. But it was kind of creeping through and making sort of danceable fun music. Prior to that, punk music was noisy and abrasive and for men and for fighting and spitting and jumping up and down and big violent gigs where you would usually get hit. I just remember gigs being violent really up until about 1985 you would assume that a gig was kind of quite a hairy place to go and you were you know, quite likely to come out with a black eye. Um, and disco had been, as you say, ceremonially killed in the and late yeah, 80s. It was, it was forbidden, basically. It was, absolutely, you know, yeah. it, was just, it was considered so uncool. You know, and, it, and it was considered shit. It yeah. was considered shit music. It was worthless and it, was not, it had no merit and there was no sort of art to it. You know. And um, it was, as punk became as blew out and it's a sort of you know sort of whatever I'm using my thread um, people just got bored of loud shouty music the kind of the, the bands brought in disco and funk and the buzzcock singer made a sort of synth pop record quite early yeah and I suppose you had um, even John Lydon Public Image Limited bringing kind of funk elements in, into, into Pill it's difficult to call Pill a funk band, but I, yeah, to my moments. mind, there's, there's, there's a huge amount of funk and dub in there, albeit slowed down and twisted and distorted. And then the Human League themselves, when they split off to form Heaven 17, 
you, you, uh, they were embracing it. Um, the factory label in Manchester, people like a certain ratio, and of course, New Order. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is kind of the precursor. These records were still quite austere, and they weren't fun exactly, but they were sort of funky, and people were starting to dance. And because of that, pop, at gigs, pop as opposed did, to just fighting, pop did very much become fun. Um, shortly after that, you've called it Mad World, new pop groups every week, and that's a telling phrase, new pop, because new pop is what it, it became known as, sort of critical discourse. This, this, um, we're talking about 1982, I guess, here, really, aren't we? My favourite year for pop music. Right. Why is that? Um, because so many of my favourite bands appeared from nowhere or from obscurity, and as far as I could tell, from nowhere at the time. There was just such a rapid turnover, wasn't there? There was, there was. There was a new band on the cover of Smash Hits every week, and they were having massive, massive hits. And they seemed to be fast-tracked as well. There was no kind of slow build-up of paying their dues and play, pa playing little clubs. Paying their dues is absolutely the way bands used to, bro to break. You had to sort of tour and tour and tour and go round and round and round and just put the hours in and the weeks in and the years in. And it was as you earned your success by having basically had your card stamped enough times that you yeah. could go up a level. Yeah. And it was, it was a very sort of rubbish. <laughs> Do you think video changed that? Of course it did, yeah, absolutely. The, you know, the, as these bands appeared, on, they didn't have to do a tour. They could just do a really cool video and it would go on top of the pops. And at the time, there were only three TV channels in Britain, so, and two of them were undeniably terrible. So th there was only ever, for kids, maybe like, I don't know, four or five programs a week on. The TV wasn't even on all day. It was sort of on half the day. And but of so, course, what, so what we were missing out on in the UK was what was going on in America, which was the launch of MTV, which allowed a lot, a lot of these bands we've been talking about to suddenly cash in on all this and, and become part of the, well, what, what became known as the second British invasion. Well, th that, that's the thing, isn't it? it in 1981, you would have a tiny, tiny radio and listen to it in the playground, and there'd be 20 people listening to the radio in the playground, listening to the charts and hearing these new records at lunchtime. But MTV was a cable channel in the States, and not everybody had cable by any means. And so one of your cooler friends had cable, so you would have parties. You'd go around to the person who had cable's house and see MTV, and you just, wouldn't just sit and watch it on your own. You'd have, you know, five or six friends would come around, and you, it would be kind of a sort of social event. So a lot of these bands we're talking about, if they had one cool video that was on rotation, they didn't have to tour the States for six months. Suddenly they didn't they have to tour the States ever. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and also, it, it became, because of this rapid turnover, and the way in which, and I, I, I will go back to punk here, and I'll say that, for me, um, even if musically punk didn't change things, it kicked open the door long enough for all these kind of strange lunatics and weirdos and eccentrics and outsiders who previously would have been on the kind of art rock fringes, to, to bust in and have top ten records. And you've got a whole well, chapter here. Well, Ghosts, well, that, new well, pops, misfits haunt the charts. That was the thing. That's the thing I was trying to say before. I think punk became a bit boring musically with just the sort of traditional notion of punk. And then the punk became an attitude, and it just became doing something weird, doing something different, and being super proud of it and super serious about it. And um, that was the attitude that came... That was the attitude that informed a lot of these bands, bands like uh, ABC and Japan and even Duran Duran and to an extent Spandau Ballet. The core members of Spandau Ballet were in a band that played at the Roxy, which was the sort of Give legendary... Give me a cider while we're talking. <laughs> Go for it. Um, so these were all kind of ex-punks who just realised that punk just meant you could do anything. At the time it meant you could be in a band, learn three chords and make a record. And then that attitude just blossomed into saying, well actually we could do anything. We can do anything that's weird and different and anything we want and we can be passionate about it and it could become successful. That's interesting because, um, as you say, um, the, the punk ethos was DIY, do it yourself. Yeah. But um, in, in, in the punk era, the important part of that was do. Uh, in the 80s, it was it. What is the it? The it can be anything. That, that's when the explosion happened, when people realised it didn't have to be um, three or four guys with guitars, bass and drums just jumping up and down and shouting. It could be absolutely anything. The, the Human League, who get mentioned in the book a lot, originally consi considered themselves a punk band. It's true, it's true. But it, it, the synthesizers meant that people could make any sort of noise. Being in a band didn't have anything to do with a drummer or a bass player or a guitarist. It could be anything. And 
the, the bands I mentioned here are quite diverse. Um, and it, the only thing they have in common is a sort of absolute freewheeling spirit to just do what they wanted and be completely different and, and annoy people and stand out and look weird and stand up and go, I'm weird and I'm very, very happy about it and fuck you if you don't like it. It's, it's the easiest and thing I hope to do, you don't it? like it. No. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's so easy to, to compare the past to the present and say, oh, it was so much better then. But the fact is that if you look at a lot of the singers like Mark Almond from Soft Cell, if he appeared on something like The X Factor, he'd just be laughed out of the studio. Um, Kevin Rowland from Dexys Midnight Runners being another one. And, and nevertheless, they were brilliant, brilliant pop stars. Absolutely. But it, it was... It was a, a, there was a parallel assault on, I think, not just musicality and rockism, but also masculinity as well, which I think David Bowie informs in an enormous way with his you know, openly bisexual, although he changed his mind about that many, many times, but proudly... So that kind of opened the doors for people. That kind of, a lot of the people that had these hits in 1981 and 1982 had seen David Bowie doing Starman in 1972. And um, they were his children, basically. Boy George and Morrissey and all those kind of people were Bowie's children. And they showed us, the next generation, different ways to, to be a man. Absolutely. So, you know, cult yeah. culturally, we're all Bowie's grandchildren because of that. <laughs> <laughs> Great grandchildren. Absolutely. Um, and another movement which took the Bowie thing from a different angle. Uh, uh, what have I done here? I've killed it. Give me a second. Um, anyway, we're going to talk about the G word, aren't we? We are, goth. yes. Goth. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, were you ever one? Uh, it, might, it might surprise you to learn that um, I was. <laughs> <laughs> I was very much a goth. It was, it was hugely exciting. I think goth was kind of the kind of end of the line that started with punk and went through post-punk and stayed black and white and serious and austere and no smiling um, and goth was kind of the end product of that it was kind of it wasn't supposed to be popular it wasn't supposed to be inclusive it wasn't supposed to be to have you know all your mates coming around your house and jumping up and down it was music for you alone in your bedroom to sort of qu quietly pity yourself or slash your wrists or just feel like or cry <laughs> how much of it do you think and you know uh, th this is I hope not too fanciful a theory is to do with the shadow of the bomb that we all thought or we all we were so certain of it we felt we knew we were all going to die well, in kind of nuclear Armageddon Pro I would imagine probably more here in Germany than anywhere else but certainly in, in the UK we, we, we felt that so um, that kind of informed the, the, the atmosphere of a lot of uh, music well, absolutely, time. it was that, you know, that Pistols No Future thing embodied that kind of thing. And there was a very real threat that, you know, the, we had leaflets through the door about what to do when a nuclear bomb goes off and you're supposed to take the doors off their hinges and lean them against the wall and put mattresses on the top and then put some food inside and you'd be absolutely fine. It was absolutely laughable. I have still have got this called Protect and Survive. And I, I often wonder whether, you know, you, there, there are German bands like you know, Exmal Deutschland or... Um, uh, even um, malaria, um, who uh, do seem to somehow carry that that sense of dread, and I, I think no, it's why we're all going to die soon anyway. And so. it's, it's why people like like Nick Cave and Depeche Mode and so on were were drawn to coming here and and, and working here in, uh, in the eighties as well. I think. But the, the funny thing was that even though those bands had only goth had only really begun to sort of congeal as a thing in sort of nineteen eighty one, nineteen eighty two, so many of those bands again just turned their back on the sort of doomy, austere stuff, and colour just came in. Susie and the Banshees started having poppy hits. Actually, the they Cure did. were the most colourful The Cure of all, is the yeah. most <laughs> obvious example, absolutely. They kind of, after three endlessly, purposefully, suicidally doomy albums. Brilliant albums. Brilliant, yeah. absolutely, I love them. But they just, they suddenly just looked, seemed to take a look out of their audience and go, fucking hell, this is, <laughs> <laughs> cheer up, love. <laughs> and they started making these very, very poppy, fun, colourful records. And just to annoy their own audience. But Robert is a contrary man, as you know. But it was... It was, it was you just didn't do that. It was against the rules. Mm. The rules of goth had only just been established. It was very clear what was and what was not goth, and what you did and what you didn't do. No smiling, black clothes, no colour, blah, blah, blah. No fun, no short poppy songs about cats. <laughs> And, and any, uh, any self-respecting goth band refused to call themselves that anyway. They would never, they hated the G word. Uh, well, so, yeah. absolutely. A goth is, is a weird genre. There was only maybe three or four good goth bands, and there are no quite good goth bands. They're all 
fucking terrible. <laughs> uh, I'd argue that, but that's a conversation for later on. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> um, and another strand of punk, what, you know, basically we're talking about what punk did next, um, is uh, to discover hip-hop. And, and I suppose, uh, I think the case you make in, in, in the book, and we're talking about people, Malcolm McLaren, The Clash, and then I suppose Big Audio Dynamite would follow on from that. Um, you've got to mention Blondie, I suppose, as well, because Blondie um, embraced hip-hop before anyone else. Well, well, Blondie were the absolute epitome of 1970s punk rock. And they were CBGBs, they were up there with the Ramones and Talking Heads and Richard Hell and all these kind of bands. And they were very much, you know, the queen of that scene. And they just... It was forced on them, I think, really, when they're... Uh, what's his name? Mike Bat? Mike... What are we talking about now? The man who produced Heart of Glass. Oh, Chapman. No, Mike Chapman. Um, retooled Heart of Glass and made it into a disco record. And the band were not happy about this at all at first. Clearly, they warmed to it. And then, instead of... Blondie were a band, as they were very keen to point out at the time, not just a, a singer... Blondie as a band, the Badgers said. But all of a sudden they had a disco hit with Heart of Glass and then within a few records they had, you know, they're having a reggae song or um, Atomic, which is my, one of my favourite pop singles ever. And then Rapture. And, and rap, exactly, yes. They just, it was just kind of everything goes. We could do this, we could do that. We don't have to be this kind of band. It doesn't have to be a bass player. There doesn't have to be a guitar part. There certainly doesn't have to be a solo. You and could do whatever you want. And I think the, the case you make in the book is that this was um, another example of black music rejuvenating um, arty white music, just as it had done five years earlier with disco and funk and so on. Absolutely. And I also think this is you know, another example of, the, of people following David Bowie in the, in the 70s, because he advanced so quickly from album to album that it was really, really difficult for bands to keep up. You know, if you got into... Uh, station to station. By the time you kind of figured out how that was how that was done and how you could make those sounds, and it would take you six months, and then a second later he's got low with all these kind of weird, again completely different things. And you, the only thing you could really glean from it is that David Bowie wouldn't stay still, wasn't going to make the same record twice, and was going to change as fast as, as uh, sorry as fast and as quickly as possible. The um, which is obviously the thing, he's called the chameleon of pop, the thing that I think one of the main things that Bowie's influence extended into the early 80s was that people didn't want to make the same record twice. They didn't want to make the same single twice, you know. It was considered boring. If you'd made a record yeah. that sounded like that and you did it again, it's like, oh, come on, mate, try harder. And it's, that was, it was such an exciting time that bands would have five singles on the trot. They really didn't sound the same at all. And, and that has fallen away from a lot of pop music these days, I think. Mm -hmm. And certainly in the time in, in between, that adventurousness, that like refusal to stand still, the refusal to be defined by what you did last year, and you know the absolute determination to sound nothing like you did last year, powered all these adventurous and weird and successful records. And I think that the other main thing that has excited me, and I've talked about this a little bit before, is that these bands were making genuinely groundbreaking records that hadn't been heard before frequently and again and again and again. And they, they, people make groundbreaking records all the time. I listen, I buy records every week. It's a habit I'll never lose. But these things are quite obscure and, you know, I rave about a band and I have to wait months before I find someone who's actually heard of them, you know. Yeah. Obviously, I'm old now, so I have old friends. <laughs> but um, um, I've lost my thread. Well, allow me to pick it up for you because... Please do. Uh, um, I, I, I would like to move on to, uh, as we are uh, running short of time now... Are we? Um, yeah, we certainly are. Um, just uh, um, where it all went wrong, really, because yeah. uh, we started off by talking about, uh, you know, did, did these bands uh, inspire the death of rock and roll? Um, there was a period in the mid-80s, and you do talk... About, you've got a whole chapter about this, and I think you, you look quite favourably upon it, but the big music... So you've got bands like Simple Minds, Echo and the Bunny Men, who you, you seem to particularly love. I do. Um, and I guess you 2 The Water Boys, Big Country... It's all quite sort of stadium-focused, and people um, re-embracing kind of rockist poses... But that that, that punk, punk and post-punk... Well, all of those away. bands kind of did, but there was a golden period in, just before 
with Simple Minds and with Echo and the Bunny Man and, and indeed with you too, where they were still kind of exciting. They kind of ended up being stadium fodder and repeating themselves endlessly. But all of those bands had a, a really fast learning curve. And they were, when Simple Minds were big and when Echo and the Bunny Man were big, these, this, is, these are, this is not rock and roll, it really isn't. I think these are definitely Bowie's children, considerably less craft work so. But this is a sort of sophisticated feminine music. It's not sweaty. It's not macho. Even you two? Mm. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Maybe not. All right. Maybe well, not. We'll, we'll probably have to um, agree disagree on that part. But um, there was also, uh, and you, you call this, this is when the sort of proper 80s kick in, when bands are, are really trying to sound very, very slick and expensive. Well, th there's two things that went wrong by the mid 80s. Number one was bands decided to make. See, Brian Eno, his man, he made some of the weirdest, weirdest records of the 70s and 80s, and still does now. But the records he produces now are so boring and bland. And, and Coldplay, Dido, things like yes, that. Yes, yeah. it's just, just awful, awful music. But he was... His production ideas just got out of hand. I, I, I find it very hard to, to equate the man who produces Coldplay to the nutcase in Roxy Music, who was there to just make things sound weird and different. Obviously, that's kind of his thing. But he doesn't make things sound weird and different anymore. He was responsible for this sort of post-Live Aid, s smooth, awful production stuff. Live Aid is very much the kind of dividing point of the 80s, isn't it? I mean, it it's, is, yes. It's, it's an easy moment to pick, but certainly the 80s after Live Aid and before Live Aid are two very different beasts. Well, and, and all... All of the bands that were cool and interesting in 1982 started to slip towards this very, very quickly. They became victims of their own success. And every band that released a really cool record in 1982 kind of tended to release a shit one in 1983. Well, you, and then you a do, really, um, really shit one in 1985. It's the perfect point to talk about. the. Um, you, you mentioned, uh, in terms of where it all went wrong, um, 1983 particularly, as when in Britain... Um, the movement kind of ran out of steam. So um, this smash hits cover with Kajagoogle on the front. I love the fact that in the book, you've got that uh, picture and underneath it just says, no. Um, and then you, you compare that with the fact that um, America had kind of finally well, that, uh, upped that, its game and, and, those, and those, discovered how, those how to the two make things. great pop records. And if you weren't really paying attention, smash hits, uh, sorry, uh, Kajagoogle kind of sounded like Duran Duran and Culture Club and various other bands. But they weren't. There, was no, there were no roots in punk rock. There was no weirdness. There was no um, transgressive ideas. There was no intellectual point behind it. They were just sort of, they were a bit like the other bands. They were sort of cut and pasted. They looked the same and they sounded close enough. And they, record companies were signing bands that looked like the bands that had been successful the year before. And it was just tragic. And Kajagoogle just upset me so much. And, and I think can continue to do so. Th these bands, like uh, I think you can also mention Howard Jones and Nick Kershaw and people like that, they didn't appear to have any roots in the kind of post-punk or alternative culture. Not at all. They, they were um, purely of the new pop. Um, yeah, this is so that, that, that link to punk had been severed. And all now. these beautiful and amazing and vibrant and exciting and 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 smart records kind of congealed and became eighties music, which is now seen as a genre, which, which is kind of rather tragic. All the kind of disparate ideas and brains and thoughts and dreams and passions that went into all these records in 1979 to 82 just sort of just got liquidized together and, you know, give, give the singer a stupid haircut and you get a record deal and you sounded kind of a bit like that. That was... I'm not expressing myself very well. But meanwhile, um, in the States, the, the American music industry had clearly looked at this British invasion and probably been pretty pissed off about it and thought, right, you know, we need to up our game here. We need and flamboyant yeah, pop stars. And, and very much went for solo artists. So we're, we're talking about Madonna, Prince, Michael Jackson. Well, um, I, I don't all know these they, just kill her. They just they, killed him. They just, didn't go for solo artists, but those guys, Madonna, Prince and Michael Jackson, obviously Michael Jackson was very famous before, but he was unbelievably famous after Thriller. And... But, you know, there's no argument. These are singular visions of, of one person. There's no bass player to fall out. There's no bitching about the singer. These people were going to make these flamboyant, weird, sexy records, and they're fucking great, you know. The early Prince records and... Well, all the Prince records, sorry, but all the early Prince records and Madonna and, and Michael Jackson, they just did it better. They took all these kind of ideas. They took 80s music 
and they were single-minded and well-funded, and they were, you know, there were plenty of bands that sounded like Depeche Mode who just, you know, tried and failed, but these people were just mercenary about it. They became a machine. Um, Michael Jackson took pop music to a, a corporate level with Thriller, and this seventh single from Thriller was Thriller, and it's like, you know, the seventh, the seventh, sing seventh single, yeah, seventh single from an album. And it's like, well, we'll have a million pound video with Vincent Price and it'll, you know, it's ridiculous. No one can compete with that. Um, the and, 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 then, and then Prince did compete with that. It's like, well, I'm not just going to have a video that looks like a film. I will have a film that <laughs> yeah, yeah. of myself and how fucking great I am, which is yeah. kind of very much modelled. It's that self-fulfilling wish of Ziggy Stardust, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Where you create your own pop star myth and, you know, self-mythologise. And it was, it was done brilliantly, brilliantly, we, expensively we, and well. We began by talking about golden age-ism and, you know, this idea of golden eras. But it does seem that this particular period in the book is um, really influential and has been probably for the last 15, 20 years. It's sort of non-stop. You've got this whole... The, the, the book ends with this chapter, All You Need Is Now, the perpetual 80s revival. I've picked these two particular albums. That's the first Duran Duran album which you say, you know, you, you think is, one of, is really one of the all-time great albums. I don't know if you've heard this one. This is the new album by it's The, the Horrors. Horrors. Yes. I don't even know if it's out yet. But it's a brilliant record, and um, it's very, very Duran Duran, a lot of it. So clearly, this stuff is still having an influence on the culture. Well, the, the sort of the 1982 music, particularly the sort of New York take on, on 1982, is, has rebooted pop music incredibly wonderfully. Things like LCD sound system... And the Killers, who I don't like, obviously, but they've they've taken. The Killers are basically Duran Duran when they started. They yeah. decided they wanted to be Bruce Springsteen and U2 after a while. But the, the model for the Killers was Duran Duran. I, li I like them at that quite point. happily yeah. and and proudly. That's what they did, and they, these things continue to inspire bands. And also, when bands are a bit sort of stuck for ideas, going a bit synth pop and sort of keeping it a bit more minimal. And um, and spare musically is is a standard move now. It's kind of the sort of thing bands do. It's like the version of an acoustic album. Absolutely. Um, we are very much um, out of time, but um, I will uh, quickly. Um, uh, if, if, well, first of all, um, if anyone has any questions, um, we'd be delighted to uh, um, answer them um, or any points I'd like to make. But also, just a, a bit of an advert here. Um, David and I are DJing um, at the festival tomorrow night at uh, Soda Salon at. Uh, midnight 40 till 2.20 and we'll be playing basically a lot of the stuff we've been talking about, post-punk, new wave, synth music of the early 80s and it'll be a lot of fun so if you're around tomorrow uh, do come Please to come. that. Um, David's got some copies of the book to sell and to sign um, outside uh, in the lobby now if you're interested. Um, anyone got any questions at all? Oh yeah, in the front there, sorry. Wow. He, he did, invented, yeah. He invented the style with his girlfriend Vivian Westwood. Yeah. So is like like um, John Layden uh, would not have come up as like he he didn't found the band. I, he would have not come up as as a singer. He he was told to sing. So how? I, I I'm not sure. I think Leiden is the exception. I think Leiden was Leiden. He was pretty much his his own Martin creation. Uh, but but what Malcolm did was remove the musicians. He took musicians from the band and put people like Sid Vicious in instead, who was hopeless, but it just he, that was he definitely cool. cast. He did looking cool was, was much more important. But I think John Lydon was very much his own man. Yeah, I think, you know, John, John Lydon is one of my favourite pop stars of all time because he's self-educated working class youth from North London who, yeah, he was lucky that he found himself in the right place at the right time. But, um, but Malcolm McLaren certainly orchestrated that. He, you know, he the controversy was pretty much yeah, his idea, and, and, and pushing it, and pushing it, and pushing it, and pushing it was definitely his idea. Yeah, and you know, people say the Sex Pistols were, were a boy band, and it's a slightly provocative take to have on them. But I think you know there is there is some truth that they they were a boy band, but they're an absolutely brilliant pop phenomenon, and I'll always prefer them to any other punk band. They're better for me. They're better than the Clash. Um, maybe. I'm thinking, are they better than the Ramones? Well, anyway, yes, they are. Yes, they are. The Sex Pistols, just because. 
punk was about more than the music. It was about um, just blowing people's minds and, and the excitement of it. And nobody caused excitement more effectively, I think, than Sex Pistols. Well, the Sex Pistols are an exception in the same way that Joy Division and Nirvana are, because they'll never make a bad record. The, Sex, the Pistols did one record, Nirvana obviously did a couple, and there was no shit records, there was no tedious fifth albums there. It's a perfect legacy. Well, I don't know. I don't know. <coughs> what the, the pistols are overrated. The huge wave that came with this is kind of like actually made from a single man's mind and not from anything. There was a huge, like, there was a huge wave, but well, he didn't write the songs. The, <laughs> you don't believe that. <laughs> the, the charts didn't get filled full of Sex Pistols records around the world after the Pistols. I mean, there, there were many, and they were pretty much all my favourite records, but they didn't take over the world, and there wasn't dozens and dozens of Sex Pistols in the top 40. Also, there's this fixation with authenticity in, in pop, that everybody thinks that music has to be the work of some kind of auteur, of, of one person who means it, man, from their very soul, from their heart. And I think a lot of the greatest pop music of all time, from Elvis Presley to Tamla Motown, was created by committee, by a whole kind of um, conveyor belt or, or, uh, or you know, um, production line, a factory almost. And um, the Sex Pistols were an example of that. And they never really made any secret of it. They used to say, you know, it's all about the money, we're making cash from chaos, um, ever get the feeling you've been cheated, all this stuff. It, they were pretty transparent about it. That's one thing I love about the Sex Pistols, is they showed the workings all the time. You could see the strings of the Puppet Master. They showed you exactly what they were doing, and they did it anyway. If that makes they sense. Didn't have a <laughs> or Maybe. It wasn't but then Leiden went off and formed Public Image Limited, and that was definitely his own thing, and I think they were a great band. So you can't credit McLaren with Pill. And of course, Public Image is the second greatest single of all time. What's the greatest? I Feel Love. Uh, so second greatest debut single. No. Oh. Debut single. Okay. Ceremony by New Order, obviously. Oh, good one. Okay. Maybe that's an argument to continue by. Any more questions? Great, well, thank you so much for being patient and listening to us. Do come along and see us DJ tomorrow. And as I say, David's got copies of the book out in the lobby if you're interested. Cheers. David Laurie, everybody. Thank, thank you. you very much.